I'm Brandi Cruz, and this is Undivided. Today, why some are so eager to have you believe that everything is about race. From the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict to the recall of Seattle's socialist city councilwoman. Plus, I'm putting my support behind an effort to make Washington's new long-term care tax optional. Let's start with a few truths. Kyle Rittenhouse is not a hero. He's not a role model for youth. He's not a poster boy for self-defense. Kyle Rittenhouse was a punk kid who should have stayed home. But in the eyes of the law, Kyle Rittenhouse is not guilty. The defendant will rise and face the jury and hearken to its verdicts. State of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. As to the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Anyone who watched that trial in good faith would have seen that verdict coming, would have known that the prevailing media narrative around Rittenhouse's actions in Kenosha, Wisconsin, was incomplete at best and intentionally false at worst would have heard from the lips of the prosecution's star witness that Rittenhouse shot him in self-defense. Does this look like right now your arm is being shot? That looks like my bicep being vaporized, yes. Okay. And it's being vaporized as you're pointing your gun directly at him. Yes? Yes. Okay, so when you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't until you pointed your gun at him, advanced on him, with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, that he fired, right? Correct. But even after a jury of 12 citizens, having heard all the evidence, acquitted Rittenhouse, some politicians and some in the press would have you believe that they know best, that they, not the jury, are the arbitrators of truth, that they, not the jury, understood all the evidence, that they, not the jury, get to decide the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. And they have decided that not only is he guilty, but that racism is to blame for the fact that he's free. This country was built on the idea of, of that white men had a, a, a particular kind of freedom and a particular kind of citizenship that only they have. Politicians also jumped on the narrative. Former presidential candidate Julian Castro writing on Twitter, you know damn well that if Kyle Rittenhouse were black, he would have been found guilty in a heartbeat or shot dead by cops on the scene. Actually, no, we literally do not know that, unless you know of a black 17-year-old who shot three people in Kenosha, killing two of them, and then stood trial on the same charges in front of the exact same judge and jury. And since that hasn't happened, all your tweets serve to do is stir up hate and unrest, as if the country doesn't have enough of both already. Vice President Kamala Harris also hopped on the racism bandwagon. Today's verdict speaks for itself. I've spent a majority of my career working to make our criminal justice system more equitable. It's clear there's still a lot more work to do. Now, it is worth a reminder that none of the people Kyle Rittenhouse shot were black. The prevailing argument seems to be that in some alternate universe, if Rittenhouse had been black, then he would be in prison right now. White politicians also jumped at the chance to show the world their anti-racism. Here in Seattle, where so much as a whisper of perceived injustice sends anarchists scrambling out of their mother's basements, King County Executive Dow Constantine had this to say as he greases the wheels of wokeness so he can run for governor in 2024. Today's verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse case is a stark reminder that our country still grapples with a racially biased criminal legal system has yet to come close to overcoming white supremacy and continues to tolerate intolerable gun violence. In Chicago, the Black Lives Matter movement was ready to protest the verdict even if Rittenhouse was convicted, posting this on Instagram, writing, regardless of the outcome, we're hitting the streets to protest this racist injustice system. 
Now, don't get me wrong, there are absolutely aspects of our criminal justice system that need to be reformed, and historically, there have been disproportionate outcomes for people of color. That's a fact, and it's a result of the fact that this country enslaved Black people, not only robbing them of their God-given right to freedom, but robbing them of their ability to build generational wealth, which resulted in higher rates of poverty. That is the reality of our country's legacy, and a wrong it is still trying to right. But if your answer to criminal justice reform is that you want to see white people wrongfully convicted, well, frankly, that sounds a little racist. All right, let's continue on this topic with a segment we call Unbelievable. Everything is racist. And if you don't think so, then you're a racist too. In Seattle, voters are gearing up to decide whether Socialist City Councilwoman Shama Sawant will get to keep her job. Sawant is being recalled for her behavior before, during, and after Seattle's autonomous protest zone known as CHOP. Washington Supreme Court approved three recall charges against her. They are as follows. One, that she gave Black Lives Matter protesters access to City Hall, which she did. Two, that she led a march to Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin's house, the address of which is protected under state law due to threats from her time as a United States attorney. Again, it's not in dispute that Sawant did this. And finally, she's accused of using city funds to promote a tax Amazon ballot initiative, something her own colleagues on the council have admonished her for before. So on December 7th, it's up to voters in Sawant's district to decide whether any of those actions warrant taking her seat away. But the city's old weekly newspaper called The Stranger wants voters to think that this isn't about Sawant's own actions, but rather, you guessed it, it's about her race. The Stranger's editorial board putting out this blast email, the headline, Sawant's recall is racist. Join The Stranger in fighting it. Interestingly, the email doesn't really explain what is racist about it. It does, however, have this bright highlighted paragraph at the end that asks readers to donate money to them to ensure the paper is, quote, able to continue covering this racist and conservative-backed recall election and whatever comes after it. Ah, yes, there we have it. Now we know what the fear-mongering is about. The stranger wants to convince you to cough up some cash. I mean, what's a little race-baiting if it makes you money, right? But let's get into the meat of the stranger's argument, or rather maybe the potatoes, because I'm pretty sure they're all vegans. The fundraising email, cleverly disguised as editorial content, links to the stranger's article about why voters should reject the Sawant recall. While the individuals who work for the recall campaign might say they vote for Democrats and oppose racism, they are ultimately taking money from hundreds of Republican donors, including at least 98 Trump donors, and using an undemocratic process to remove a woman of color from power for supporting BLM protesters two summers ago. That's what's going on here. Is that what's going on here? First of all, it's hard to call a recall undemocratic considering it's done with a vote of the people who elected her. That sounds pretty damn democratic to me. Now, let's get into this narrative that this is a right-wing recall, a narrative Sawant has pushed from the very beginning. I guess it's important to understand that Sawant considers anything right of her right wing. So if that's the standard, then we're all guilty. Remember, District 3 includes some of the most progressive voters in the city. I mean, after all, they've elected Sawant three times. So let's just say that there aren't a ton of conservative folks up there. But the truth behind who's driving Sawant's recall is in the numbers, and both she and the stranger would be wise to pay attention. The Recall Sawant campaign, which is behind the effort to unseat her, has raised $745,000, 18% of which came from people who live outside of the city. But 40% of donations are from people who live in District 3. In contrast, here are the numbers for the Shama Solidarity campaign, which is defending her against the recall. It has raised $844,000, but 54% of that came into Seattle from outside the city. A measly 23% is from inside her own district. So Sawant and the stranger can call the folks supporting her recall anything they want. Racist, right-wing, they can use fear to fundraise. But the people they're name-calling and labeling are her constituents and their readers. They would be smart to keep that in mind. Because Sawant's out-of-state donors can give her all the money they want, but none of it 
is more powerful than a ballot in the hands of a voter. One of the reasons I got out of corporate media is because, frankly, I wanted to speak plainly and honestly about issues. I didn't want to pretend that bad ideas and bad policy made sense out of some misplaced need for balance. So you're going to start to hear me advocate for or against things from time to time. I'm going to do this very judiciously, but I'm going to do it when there's an opportunity for government to do better. And this is one of those moments. Today, I'm going to put my support behind I-1436. It's an initiative that would make the state's long-term care tax optional. The long-term care tax will start taking money out of your paychecks on January 1st and every year after that until you retire. Then, if you need help when you're older, it will pay a one-time benefit of up to $36,500 to help with care. Listen, it is a noble idea and certainly one that many older Americans would benefit from. But the long-term care tax simply has too many obvious flaws. And while lawmakers can fix them down the road, government shouldn't be in the practice of passing legislation without thinking it through. To name just a few of the issues, Washingtonians who are close to retirement will have to start paying the tax, but won't work long enough to get the benefit. If you live in Oregon or Idaho, for example, but work in Washington, you have to pay the tax, but you won't qualify for the benefit. If you decide to retire out of state, you'll have paid the tax your entire working life, but again, you won't qualify for the benefit. And then there's the issue of opting out. Washingtonians were given one chance to opt out of the tax, but only if they bought private long-term care insurance. The issue is that companies who offered that insurance pulled those plans out of the state because they knew that people would buy a private plan only to opt out of the state plan and then cancel their private plan a couple weeks or a couple months later. So here's where I-1436 comes in. It doesn't do away with a long-term care tax, but it makes a common sense adjustment. It would allow you to decide whether to opt in or opt out. So you would get a say in whether you want to contribute to and ultimately benefit from the long-term care fund. And given the fact that we have so many progressive voters in our state, I'm sure many will voluntarily opt in to help lower income individuals afford care when they're older. And certainly, if the changes in I-1436 are adopted, I would expect that every single state lawmaker who passed the original tax will opt in because they thought the fund was such a good idea in the first place. So I am going to be signing my name to I-1436. I'm not telling you what to do. You're smart. Look at the facts. Do what you want to do. But uh, if you want to, you can get a form like this one. I've already got makeup on mine somehow. Um, you can get a form like this one by visiting yeson1436.com. Uh, and you can sign it. You can help by getting your friends and your family to sign it as well, as long as all of them are uh, voters in Washington state, of course. you got to be a registered voter in Washington state to sign a board. Uh, and then make sure uh, that you get this in the mail. I think the deadline is you got to mail all petitions back no later than December 15th. And it doesn't have to be full. It's got room for 20 signatures. You don't have to get 20 signatures in order to mail it in. I mean, if you just got a couple on there, that's totally fine as well. And listen, here's what I'll say about this. This is not about wanting people to struggle with care when they're older. It is about one thing. It's about, and one for me at least, and you know, I can't speak for the people behind 1436, but for me, putting my uh, support behind it um, is, is about one thing. It's about sending a message to elected leaders that we expect them, no matter what they're doing, to act with thought, common sense, and careful consideration, especially when deciding whether to pass a new tax on hardworking people in the middle of a pandemic. All right, thank you so much for joining us on Undivided, a new podcast that's coming your way tomorrow. And don't forget, if you haven't already, to subscribe to my Patreon. By doing so, you are helping me build a new movement in media.